right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Hal Shirtliff. I'm the Regional Field Director for the John Birch Society in the Northeast. And welcome to our annual Christmas breakfast in uh, North Reading, Massachusetts. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, I want to mention a few of the things he's authored. Uh, his uh, magnus opus, is that the right word for it? Uh, the Pig Swastika. Uh, that talks about the, uh, the homosexuals in the Nazi party. And then up to today's, uh, how, how the how the influences today. Now I got this book, I think the John Birch Society carried the book uh, back when it first came out, and I remember reading it, and I uh, thought, you know something, I've heard about this before, because in 1990 I met a gentleman that had been a Hitler Jugend as a 12 year old boy, Hitler Youth, he was in Battle of Berlin, and this man, uh, he was not there because he wanted to be there, it was either you were Hitler Youth or your parents are uh, in concentration camps. So. Uh, he was in the Battle of Berlin as a 12-year-old boy and spent about four or five years in a Russian prisoner war camp. And he said he got out of there and he said, I had enough with Nazis and communists. I'm coming to the United States. <laughs> Unfortunately, the Nazis and communists weren't uh, were a generation behind them. But anyway, um, I, I read the book and I think I interviewed Scott. I was uh, filling in on a radio show back just when you're living out in the northwest part of the United States. And I met Scott. Um, and by the way, he has this great book, so please avail yourself of copies, and he has one that I'm not familiar with, Redeeming the Rainbow, dealing with the homosexual movement and how to get people out of that movement, I guess, and uh, why, why you should be concerned. A lot of folks in the freedom movement uh, don't look at this issue as very important. <coughs> Anybody hear of John, John Maynard Keynes, the, uh, oh. the uh, economist, oh, yeah. Keynesian economist? Well, he, he was a uh, homosexual. And um, uh, he had a, a partner by the name of, I'm pronouncing his name wrong, Lytton of Lytton Strachny. And in a letter that Lytton wrote to, uh, to uh, John Maynard Keynes, he said, we're going to have a homosexual world by the year 2000. <coughs> and I tell people, what did he know that people today are still in denial? You see, they're still, what did he know about the infrastructure? So it's not just about the economy. It's not just about you know, issues, uh, other issues. This is a critical issue. And the state, states around the country are spending millions promoting this lifestyle. In the year 2000, the state of Massachusetts held a symposium at our taxpayers' expense how to promote this in the schools, how to deflect parental uh, influence, and Kevin Jennings was one of the presenters. And it was the most vulgar and disgusting topics that they brought up that you couldn't mention in polite company that were addressed there. And it was a man who actually taped it illegally is how we know about it. And that happened 12 years ago. So people think, well, you know, live and let live, that's all well and good, but there's an aggressive promotion of this, and it's part of undermining the morality of our nation. So it's a key part of it. Anyway, Scott Lively uh, currently resides in the Springfield area, Pastor Lively. He has a very uh, vibrant inner city ministry, uh, Redemption Gate Ministries, and uh, I think he's a native of uh, Massachusetts and uh, moved out to the northwest part of the uh, country we passed their church and spent some time in California. So let's give him a nice warm hand. Well, God bless you all. Thank you for the invitation to be here this morning. <clears throat> yeah, I grew up in, uh, in Shelburne Falls, the village of Shelburne Falls, and uh, uh, left when I was 19, uh, gone for 30 years, came back to Massachusetts, uh, January 5th, 2008, as a missionary to inner city Springfield. And that's where my wife and I operate now. We have uh, a, a little mission church called the Holy Grounds Coffee House, which is unlike any church you've ever seen. And, uh, and we work with the street people and uh, alcoholics, mentally ill. Uh, and, uh, and that's uh, our home base. We live in, in the middle of the worst neighborhood. And I what I tell people, especially when I go around the country speaking, uh, that uh, Massachusetts is the most morally corrupt state in the Union, and that Springfield is about the most broken down, poverty stricken, violent city in Massachusetts. I mean, there are some, there are some competitors, but pretty close. <laughs> and uh, and, and, and Ann and I went there. We, we moved into the worst neighborhood in Springfield, and we bought the most broken down uh, house in that neighborhood. Uh, a place that was so bad 
that the real estate agent who has a listing wouldn't even go in until they did that. There was a there was a squatter living in the house. It was a, all, they had stolen all the plumbing out of the place. Uh, there were squatters in there. They engaging in prostitution, and selling crack, and and uh, and the the place the place was in 25 years of disrepair. The the, the, the the sewer pipe had collapsed under the front yard and made made a crater so big that the front sidewalk had fallen into the hole. And the uh, the chimneys were breaking down. The bat, the bulkhead that led in the basement had all collapsed. Uh, the the house was filled with 10 tons of trash, literally 10 tons of trash. We filled two 30-yard dumpsters. Scientifically, we packed it so tight we almost created a black hole. <laughs> two 30-yard dumpsters after taking out all the uh, the metal and the cardboard and all that sort of stuff. So anyway, I'm a guy that likes big challenges. <laughs> <laughs> My wife, she wouldn't move into the place until we had a working toilet. Uh, so I was there for about three weeks by myself. Uh, but uh, but we're living there now. We're still not done. There's a lot of work left to do. But I, I went there for the purpose of re-Christianizing a post-Christian city. Nobody's ever done this before. Like I said, I like big challenges. And uh, and what better before picture than Springfield? It, it's uh, just a few years ago, it was right on the verge of bankruptcy because of political corruption in the city government. Uh, it's the crossroads of the drug traffic in New England. Um, a, a high, high incident of murders. Uh, and uh, it was on Forbes magazine's list of 10 fastest dying cities. And so it's the perfect before picture. And we went there to show, by example, how biblical living can change things. We did it by moving right into the worst house in the worst neighborhood and showing by example how it's done. And there isn't a day that, that goes by in the summertime that somebody doesn't walk past that house and say, it's an amazing thing that you have done here. And we're known for that all over the, the, the whole neighborhood. In fact, we have our little tiny uh, coffee house is smaller than this room. We can only fit 45 people in that room. And yet we have more of an impact on Springfield than any other church in the whole area. We have a budget that was less than $25,000. And yet we are have a massive impact on the city. And uh, anyway, I didn't come here to talk about that. I just kind of lay the groundwork. That's who I am. I like big challenges. And there's no bigger challenge in this world than standing up to the homosexual political agenda. Now, I was an alcoholic and a drug addict for 16 years. My dad was mentally ill when I was growing up. When I was about 9 or 10, he started to, to get worse and worse. I retreated into alcoholism uh, at the age of 12, and, uh, and I spent 16 years in bondage. And uh, I was on my own at the age of 16. I hitchhiked and drifted all over the United States, and, uh, and I lived the life that the, that the left advocates. Do your own thing. Follow your heart, right? Do what feels good. All of those slogans from the 60s and 70s, I believed them and I lived them and it almost killed me. And then uh, in February of 1986, when I had no place left to turn, I had, it, life was just complete, total misery to me at that point. I, I, I had no place left to turn. I finally got down on my knees and I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. Bam, just like that. I was healed and delivered in prayer, instantly. Never had another desire to take drugs or drink ever again. And I'm a guy that I couldn't go four hours without getting high. If I ran out of, out of dope, I'd be out in the city parks just talking to any stranger going by, seeing if I could find some somebody else that would, that would be another source for getting high. And yet, when, when, he, when he took it away, it was gone completely. And since that day, I've never had another desire to drink. Well, the scripture says, to whom much is given, much is required. And, uh, you know, and I believe, I'm a firm believer, that there's nothing that happens by accident in God's universe. That in his economy, everything has a place and purpose. And, and all the things that I went through were all preparation. Uh, the Lord had made me and allowed me to go through things where I could handle a ministry that not very many other people could handle. And that's standing up on the homosexual issue. Back then, this is back in 1986, it took a couple years for the Lord to sort of get me back on track again. Uh, taught me how to be a man, how to be a, a husband to my wife, because I was married at, at that point. I was off the street at that point. I was married. We had two kids. <coughs> Speak up a little bit. Yeah, there's some background noise. Okay. All right. What's that? Microphone. 
this, is this uh, for just that? No, that's that? just the mic for the camera. Yeah, okay, all right. And, uh, and anyway, my, uh, this is what the Lord gave me to do. And back then, about 1988, 1989, when I started, there was still a pretty sizable uh, percentage of the population that was on board with the idea of standing for biblical values against the homosexual political agenda. And over the course of now a little over 20 years that we've seen that steadily decline, we have consistently lost ground on, on this topic until we have come to a place where, uh, where they, they've achieved almost everything that they want to achieve. And uh, the real goal is, to, is control, and we knew that. I learned that along the way. This is the, the ultimate moral issue of the end times. My theology, I don't think we've got much time left. And, and when you see the, uh, how the, uh, the, the world is shaping up, all the things that the scripture talks about in terms of the end days, they're just lining up right after the other. And, and, uh, but e in e either case, whether I'm right or whether I'm wrong, we have still reached a place where the founding fathers are turning over in their graves at what we've allowed to happen to our country. And a significant part of this comes down to the homosexual political movement. And this is foundational. This is, this is deeper than, than fiscal issues and, and, uh, and, and you know, secular issues. This goes right down to the idea of where do we stand as human beings in relation to what God said about our, the very essence of who we are as human beings. How do we deal with the issue of sexuality as human beings under, in, in God's world and under his system of accountability? And we didn't have this issue back in the 1940s and before. Uh, there had always been a, a discrete subculture of people who wanted to live outside of the mainstream, uh, but it wasn't until the late 1940s that we really began to have to start dealing with this when they made their move and here in this country. But that move didn't start here in this country. The, the modern political, homosexual political movement actually started in Germany. That's what this book is about. The pink swastika homosexuality in the Nazi party is, is a couple of things. One, it is a, it's documentary evidence in support of Romans chapter one. How many people know what I'm talking about? Romans chapter one in the Bible, right? Uh, the, that where homosexuality is defined by God as being representative of the reprobate mind, the depraved mind. And then at the end of Romans 1, there's a laundry list of antisocial behaviors that really describe apostasy. And this is documentary e evidence that, 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 that Romans 1 is true and that it's associated with homosexuality. And Secondly, the pink swastika is, a, is a, uh, a review of the historical record of the dress rehearsal for today. Because what they did in Germany, they're doing in this country. And it isn't just about morality. It's about the whole spectrum of things that the John Birch Society deals with uh, has a foundation in, the, in this conflict between two fund fundamentally opposite, contradictory worldviews. The one, the first worldview, the, the Judeo-Christian worldview is that we are created in the image of God, and that we are given standards that we're supposed to be able, we're supposed to, to live by regarding uh, sexuality, regarding family and marriage. That's called the Judeo-Christian sexual ethic, monogamous heterosexual marriage for life, faithful, in, with fidelity. That's the Judeo-Christian sexual ethic. It says that there is no room for sexual conduct outside of marriage. That's the standard. Now, we don't adhere to that anymore as a culture, but that's what God said to do. The contradictory, opposite perspective, I call the gay ethic of sexual license. And that's because that's the essence of what this movement is all about. The idea that there shouldn't be any restrictions on sexual conduct outside of the principle of mutual consent. And that these two contradictory worldviews uh, have been in conflict and, and at war for the, to decide who is going to prevail in our society in America. We are the dominant culture of the world. And what happens in the United States <coughs> happens across the globe. And they have known this for a very long time. And that battle has been fought throughout the centuries in different times in different places. It always comes down to that. Are we going to, are we going to do what God said? Or are we going to do what our flesh wants? And 
that decision came to a head first in Germany and then and then here in the United States. The the uh, the roots of the homosexual political movement, the modern homosexual political movement, go back to the 1860s in Germany with a man named Karl Heinrich Ulrichs, the so-called grandfather of gay rights. Uh, Ulrichs had been molested as a boy when he became an adult. Uh, he was uh, uh, an, an attorney, and uh, he used his influence in order to try to overthrow and repeal paragraph 175 of the German legal code which criminalized sodomy. He's the inventor of the born that way argument. Right? He called it the third sex theory. He said that male homosexuals are really female souls trapped inside men's bodies and lesbians are really male souls trapped inside uh, uh, Anyway, you get the idea. <laughs> it gets very confusing, believe me. Uh, but, but anyway, this is the idea that, that, that they're born this way. It's God's fault. He kind of mixed up the, the spirits with the bodies. And, uh, and uh, therefore, in fact, these guys, him and, and his close associates, were the ones that invented the term homosexual. Homosexual was invented just like the word gay was stolen and redefined in order to create a... A, it was part of a propaganda campaign to create a euphemism or a, 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 a new way to explain something that was really dirty and to give it a new title that didn't sound so dirty. Because what, what homosexuals were called before that was sodomites, always associated with you know, Genesis 19, the, you know, the practice of sodomy. And, but when, when Ulrichs and his, and his close associates, they invented this term homosexual, to take the perspective away from this idea of a, of a moral weakness and to create the idea of a medical condition. And of course, if somebody's got a medical condition that they're born with, you certainly can't have the kind of hostility toward them that you would if you think that they're engaging in, in behavior that they can control. Right? That's where the word homosexual comes from. Now, homosexual is, is a dirty word because it's associated with sodomy. And so they have to invent another word to sort of get it away from that. So now they take one of the, one of the, the nicest words that we had, right? I mean, uh, gay used to be a wonderful word. It was, it's in all the songs. It's the word you used when you wanted to talk about, about being, a, being carefree and filled with joy and happiness, right? That's what gay meant. So they stole it. And now they, they in order to, to label themselves in a way that gets away from this dirty word, Homosexual. Anyway, Ulrich's theory was that men were really women. That homosexual men were really women, and lesbians were really men. And uh, and that attracted a lot of, of effeminate homosexuals who didn't mind being identified as women, but it was very offensive to the other half who are masculine-oriented homosexuals. When you think about this, most people don't really... When, you, when we think, we talk about homosexuality in our modern culture, we only think about, about effeminate men, right? Because they stand out, right? These are men acting like women, so you notice them. But, but homosexuality is on, is on a spectrum of gender identity confusion. That on the one extreme is, is effem effeminacy, but on the other extreme is masculinity. And a male homosexual with a masculine orientation is invisible. You don't know he's a homosexual unless he tells you, uh, or you find out something about his conduct. But there are, there are just as many masculine-oriented male homosexuals as there are effeminate male homosexuals. And in Germany, that was true there as well, and these men were enormously insulted when Ulrichs came up and started saying that all homosexuals are women. And they formed their counter-organization uh, around 1902 called the Gemeinschaft der Eigenen the community of the, of the elite, or community of the special ones, and they built up their own faction of the German gay subculture on this idea that, that, that homosexual men are not only masculine, but they're more masculine than natural men, and that all societies of the history of the world have arisen out of this, this ultra-masculine homosexual culture. They literally taught that. In fact, Hans Bluer was a philosopher uh, of the pre-Nazi era that was, that was uh, enormously popular. And Hitler read this guy's... Uh, uh, Alfred Rosenberg actually was built a 
lot of his teaching on what Hans Bloor was saying, that, that, that all nation states have arisen out of this ultra-masculine male culture. There's a lot of stuff that you never heard, and that's what this book is about. It's 400 pages of documentation about these things. And when you hear people say, well, that can't be true, the pink swastika is a bunch of nonsense because the homosexuals put, I mean, the Nazis put homosexuals in concentration camps, right? They couldn't have been homosexual. Well, unless, until you, until you know about what was going on between the, the rivalry between these two factions of the gay movement, then, then, it, would, then, then it seems like nonsense. But when, Albert, uh, when, uh, when Adolf Hitler finally came to power in 1933, the first people that he went after were the effeminate homosexuals uh, associated with the Scientific Humanitarian Committee uh, based in their headquarters in, at the Sex Research Institute of Berlin, which was the, the German precursor to the Kinsey Institute, right there in Berlin. It was the headquarters for the Femmes, who were aligned with the Communists. And, and, and the, the butch, masculine homosexuals who created the Nazi party, they weren't just in it, they created it. There wouldn't have ever been a Nazi party if it hadn't been for these guys, right? So that one of the reasons why they attacked me so fiercely uh, be, about this book is that they just simply cannot allow this information to come out. It just damages every aspect of the left agenda because they built so much on the idea that people who are against them are like the Nazis. They were like the Nazis. What did, they, what did the Nazis have? They had national socialism. It wasn't right wing, it was left wing. In fact, what they had then is looks pretty close to what we've got now. We've got a socialist system it hasn't been fully implemented, but it's a socialist system that's been nationalized. Right? We've got national socialism, very similar to what the, what the Nazis put it. In any case, uh, 400 pages of documentation on that. I'm not, I don't have enough time to go in, even into, into detail, uh, even to summarize the chapters. But you know, get the book and read it. And just understand that when you're talking about uh, what happened in, in Nazi Germany, you're talking about something that was in large part a dress rehearsal for what's happening now, and it's centered around sexual perversion. Well, in in uh, in Germany, the uh, at the at the peak of the homosexual movement there in the 1920s, uh, the well, it, it peaked a little after, but when it really started, when it came into its own, they created a. In fact, members of the early Nazi Party created the first major homosexual rights organization that called the, the uh, uh, Society for Human Rights. First use of the, of the Association of Human Rights with Homosexuality was by Nazis who created a homosexual organization to legitimize homosexuality in Germany. And the most prominent member of this society was Ernst Röhm, who was the head of the SA. He was, he was that power behind the throne. He was the man who had more authority in the early Nazi party than Alfred Hitler, than, than, why do I keep calling him Alfred? Adolf Hitler did. And when, when uh, Ernst Röhm came to power, at the, head of, at, the, at the peak of his power, he had 3,000 men under his command in the SA. Now, Hitler did have him, uh, him assassinated, but nevertheless, this is the guy who, who, who was central to the creation of this of the Society for Human Rights. Now, after World War I, uh, the the U.S. had occupying troops in Germany, and one of those uh, soldiers was a man named Henry Gerber. Henry Gerber, a German American, was also a homosexual. Got involved with the German uh, uh, Society for Human Rights, liked what they were doing, and came back to the United States. And in 1924, created the first open homosexual organization in the United States in Chicago, uh, uh, called the it was the American chapter of the Society for Human Rights. Uh, Henry Gerber uh, was arrested. Him and the two other men who formed this were arrested shortly thereafter uh, for sexually abusing uh, boys, and the, the 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 organization was disbanded. Two of them went to jail. Gerber managed to bribe his way out of it. Went underground. Uh, but uh, out of this little group, one of those men, I think Gerber himself might have been, molested a boy named Champ Simmons. Champ Simmons grew to be a man, and he molested a boy named Harry Hay. Anybody know who Harry Hay is? Yep. Harry Hay is the father of the American gay movement. 
and uh, he launched the Mattachine Society, I think it was 1940-51, that he had been operating, uh, at, uh, building a homosexual political network in the United States for quite some time. He was a teacher of Marxist theory for 18 years before he formed the Mattachine Society, and he took all these principles that the communists had developed about how to overthrow a culture, how to overthrow uh, an economic system, and simply applied those principles to morality. And the, the, the goal of the Mattachine Society was to overthrow the Judeo-Christian model and bring in this idea of sexual freedom. Now, 1948, even before the Mattachine Society was officially formed, Alfred Kinsey became the first major gay rights activist. He was, not, he was in the closet. Nobody knew what he, his, his profile for 20 years, but he really launched the sexual revolution with his report, uh, Sexual Behavior in the Human Male. And uh, uh, Kinsey was an in-the-closet homosexual. He was involved in, in sadomasochism, every kind of sexual perversion. And his philosophy that he taught was that, was that, was sexual freedom. In fact, he was funded by the Rockefeller Foundation. Anybody familiar with the Rockefeller Foundation? <laughs> right. He was funded by the Rockefeller Foundation. I wonder why they would be so interested in this guy. He went to all the elite universities around the country where he taught the, the, the college-aged young men. In fact, the, the universities were filled mostly with men at this point. The, and the, the, these are the elite colleges where these men are, young men are being trained to be the heads of the corporations and agencies, etc., uh, in the next generation. And Kinsey went to them and told them that the procreative view of sexuality that your parents have is destructive to America because what it does is it causes people to repress their natural sexuality. And that's the reason we have sex crimes. And if we simply let everybody do what they wanted to do, there would be no more rapes. There would be no more child molestations. There would be no more uh, of the, any of these uh, sexual crimes. And, uh, and he's telling the young men, therefore, break free of that. Go out and have sex with whoever you want to. And, and, uh, and you'll be doing a good thing for your society. Sort of like trying to, to give candy to, uh, to kindergartners, right? Of course, they're, they they want to they want to believe this. Not everybody did, but enough did that it really began to have a big impact. And Kinsey is the reason why all of the laws we have regarding sexuality were eventually completely changed and overthrown, and even continues to this day. 2003, the U.S. Supreme Court uh, struck down the Texas sodomy law, uh, and Justice Kennedy, who wrote for the majority, I'm an attorney uh, also, by the way. Uh, my little law firm, and when I was I was working uh, in California at this time, I, I had a, pr uh, a private for-profit law firm. Uh, I was the managing partner of that, and also had founded the Pro Family Law Center. Uh, we were the only firm in the United States to actually file a petition with the Supreme Court, asking them not to take that case, because we knew if they did take the case, we were probably going to lose it, and that's exactly what happened. And when Kennedy, this, I believe this is the worst decision in the history of the United States, bar none, uh, because of the, of the, of the long-term implications for it in terms of the, of the breakdown of the infrastructure of our culture. And what Kennedy wrote in his majority opinion was that he could have just simply struck down Bowers versus Hardwick. Uh, he, or, or, no, he could have simply ruled narrowly on the Texas statute and given remedy to the plaintiffs on that. But instead, he decided to strike down Bowers versus Hardwick, the, 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 the case from 1986, which had regul would recognize the rights of states to regulate sexual conduct. Right? That's what Bowers stood for. He struck that down. And this is, I cannot believe that a, that a, that a US uh, Supreme Court justice would say this, but he said that public morality cannot be the basis for law. You get that? This is the, the actual Supreme Court justice says this. Public morality cannot be the basis for law. And that, and that, that he said, we specifically are writing this majority opinion in order to remove the stigma from homosexuality in American society. So what do you think that uh, bodes for this decision that the Supreme Court has just uh, uh, taken on for the gay marriage cases? I, I'll bet you um, uh, two to one that it goes against us. There's a possibility they won't. There's five Catholics on the Supreme Court. Maybe, maybe because that's so central to their theology, they may decide that 
preserving the, 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 the mere definition of marriage is something that they're going to, to have to do. But uh, in any case, getting pretty far afield with all this. Uh, Harry Hay launched uh, the, the movement, the gay rights movement. Kinsey advanced it with this. And, uh, and we're dealing with the fallout from it today in, in our society. That if you, if you think about it, everything that we're dealing with, all the social problems we have come down to this. Because if just follow the trail, follow the, follow the sequence of, of logical steps that, have, that have, they have taken since that point. That in 1940, if you had come forward and said, we want to legitimize homosexuality. And if Harry Hay had stepped forward and says, hey, I'm going down to the grammar school, and I'm going to start teaching the kids that gay is good and they should experiment with it, right? He would have been thrown in jail, right? Over 50 years now, it's what, 50-something years, we've now come to a place where that's the law of the land in California, right? They have to teach the homosexual agenda to kids in the public schools now. It's mandated by law. Or in, the, in the space of just 50 years, how did this happen? How, did, how it happened was if, if you're a strategist, a homosexual strategist back in 1948, 1950, 1951, and you're saying, how are we going to reach that eventual goal? You know, if they looked at their crystal ball and said, wow, look what we get to do in 2012. How do we get there? Well, we can't come out and advocate homosexuality. Right? We're going to have to get the rest of the people to change their morality. And that's what they did. They began to promote heterosexual promiscuity. So it goes Hay, then Kinsey, who lays the philosophical foundation for this new way of thinking called sexual freedom. And sexual freedom as opposed to the restrictions of Judeo-Christian morality. And then the next person to follow behind that is Hugh Hefner, launches Playboy magazine in 1953, who described himself as, Kent, as Kinsey's pamphleteer. In other words, he took Kinsey's philosophy of, 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 of unfettered sexual license, and he put pictures to it. That's all he did. And then that began to, to, uh, to spread it even faster. Now, at the end of the 1950s, there was a counter-movement for a while. The women's movement stood up against this for a little bit. They said, hey, we don't want to be treated like sex objects. Right? There was a slogan sort of going around at that point. But there were also lesbians in the feminist movement. And they began, and there's also you know, women that didn't want to be constrained by sexual uh, values. And they began advocating for the idea that true freedom for women meant being able to do what the men were doing. Not getting the men to go back to, be, to morality, but unshackling the women to do the same thing. And that is what we really call the sexual revolution. It didn't start in the 60s. It started in the late 40s. But it came to fruition at that point when, really, when the women finally said yes. And then it just exploded. And that's, what, that's the, 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 the 60s. Free love. That was the, what the, the movement was defined by. It wasn't free. It comes with a heavy cost. But it's, it's the philosophy of sexual freedom. And in the 1960s, Americans corporately, not every person, but corporately, we chose sexual freedom over family as a central policy of our society. Now, in order to do that, here's the problem. When, when people in the early 60s started coming out and living this lifestyle, they were still pretty few in number. But, but as soon as they started doing it, babies are being born, right? That's what happens when men and women get together, right? They start having babies. And, now, and this is a huge threat. And this is, all, you know, this is all tied in with the globalists also. This isn't happening spontaneously. This stuff is orchestrated because they know how, they, how they're going to bring a society under control. You have to break the, the, the morality. You have to break people away from the Bible, which, which teaches them to, to stand solidly upon, upon the biblical foundation. And in order to bring them into a socialist network, a socialist system, where they can be turned into cogs in a machine, you've got to break their moral fiber. And, that, and that's, that's how they're involved in this. And that's, they're the ones who pull the strings to deciding what cases are going to get into the Supreme Court. Right? So if you're going to have sexual freedom over family, there's, there's a few things you have to put in place right away. What's the first one? 
contraception on demand. I'm not Catholic. I don't have the same perspective that they do about contraception. But the only reason for contraception on demand as a social policy is to facilitate fornication. That's it in terms of uh, of being able to having it, having it be a, a central policy. 1966 Griswold versus Connecticut contraception on demand. Right? People don't always use contraception. It doesn't always work. You have to have a backup system. What's that? Abortion. Abortion is the backup system to contraception. 1973, Roe versus Wade establishes abortion on demand. Then you've got, so here you are, 1973, you now have all the aspects of the culture war we're fighting about are already in place, right? You've got, you've got no-fault divorce. You've got uh, you know, rejection of the sanctity of marriage. You've got, you've got rampant sexuality, you know, people who don't care about getting married anymore. You've got, uh, you've got abortion, and you've got uh, the homosexual movement. It's really, it came out of the closet beginning in the 60s. By 1969 or so, the Stonewall riots and all that, they just took their place at the head of the parade that they had launched themselves back in the 40s, and they have never left. They've been at the head of that parade ever since. And now that parade leads all the way into the, the, the White House of the United States, and it leads into the kindergarten classrooms of every child in California and many of the other states of the Union. Now, what happens in this kind of sexually free society is that not all the women kill their babies just because they have a chance to. And so now you have all kinds of people, but at the same time, these men and women no longer have a commitment to be married. So you have men that have gone from woman to woman to woman to woman, and women that have gone from man to man to man to man, and all of a sudden there's these babies all over the place, and no husbands, and moms at home, with, with no ability to earn for herself, and what has to happen in that kind of a system? The government can't just simply let everyone starve to death, right? There have to be entitlement programs. You've got to be able to replace dad. So that's where the, they really start happening in the 1970s, right? If you look at the graphs and see when, when did all these things start, they started as a direct consequence of the sexual revolution, right? And so now there's huge programs all over the place in order to, to, to provide for the moms and the children that are no longer have dad at home, right? And how are you going to pay for these things, right? You've got to raise taxes, right? Every single thing we're dealing with, every single aspect of the culture war, it all comes down to a choice between whether we're going to follow God regarding sexuality or whether we're going to embrace this gay ethic of sexual license. That's it. And now who, at the end of this process, when we've almost lost everything, right? We've almost lost everything that the Founding Fathers gave us. Now, there's still a lot there. The infrastructure is still largely in place. But the, it's just the skeleton now. The flesh has fallen off the bones, and the bones are beginning to crack and break. Right? Who's left fighting about this at the end of the process? It's Christians and homosexuals, right? Behind every single one of these attacks that, we're, that you read in the newspaper about attacks on religious liberty or, or, uh, or in-your-face uh, radical, outrageous social actions, who's behind those things? It's homosexual activists, right? Am I the only one that sees this? <laughs> and who are the people on the other side that are standing up to it? It's Christians. Now, there's still secular people who have traditional values. They mostly have gray hair at this point, right? You start interviewing the high school kids coming out of the high schools, and you're about 90, 90 9 to 1 uh, in terms of, of anybody that holds to, to my values. And that's all part of the plan, too. What are we going to do about all this? Right? We're going to, to do what the Founding Fathers did. You know, I call myself a Biblitarian. I'm a Biblitarian. I'm a Bible-based Libertarian. I believe in civil liberties, and I recognize that's what the Founding Fathers were. The Founding Fathers were not Libertarians the way we think of Libertarians today. They were Biblitarians. They stood, every single one of them, even if they weren't strong believers, they acknowledged God. They were God-fearing, even if they were not God-following. And that's, that's, uh, that, that's the answer to all of this. Just like it, when a marriage is in trouble. I was a family law attorney in Southern California. And, uh, and I dealt every day, all day long. Most of my clients were Christians because I marketed to the churches. 
and I wouldn't do a non-biblical divorce. I wouldn't initiate one. So almost all my clients were, were Christians who were being divorced by their spouse. And my <coughs> emphasis was trying to save the marriages, right? I like big challenges, whatever. And, uh, and, and I was able to save about 10, 10 or 15% of the marriages that came through my door. And, uh, and when I would deal with, the, with these people, the, the thing that would save the marriage, if they were willing to do it, was to get back to the basics, get back to the fundamentals. Husbands, if you do what God told you to do in taking care of your wife, you're going to have the biggest impact on her heart that it's possible to have. You cherish her. You show her that you cherish her, and you begin acting like that and talking like that, and, you and you're going to have a chance of being able to save your marriage. And you, same thing, wives. If you respect your husband, and you come into alignment with him, with Christ at the head, and your, your husband as your head, and you in alignment with him, even if he's not doing what he's supposed to do, you have the best chance of being able to save this marriage. And you know, we did save some of them. Now, as citizens of the United States that have been handed, we were handed the most precious gift that's ever been given to any civic society. We have been given the Constitution of the United States. We have been given a society that's built on biblical values. Every single aspect of who we are as a nation rests upon the fact that we held God up and God blesses those nations who honored him. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. That's the truth. And if we have any chance of being able to turn things around from where they are right now, it has to be getting back to those basics. We have to speak the plain truth. We have to stop uh, uh, compromising our values. We have to stop secularizing our terminology. We have to stop caring about what other people think. We have to stop caring about what the media thinks. Right? I'm a great one for doing that. <laughs> Let me tell you where I'm at right now in terms of myself. There's a cost that comes with this, right? And, and we're at the place now, at the end of this process, that's like it was at the beginning, where the founding fathers had to pledge their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honors. That's not just hyperbole, right? This, this is just something that, it's a poem that we recite before we go back out and watch Desperate Housewives or something, right? This is a, a reality that they lived. And that's where we have to be right now, because we cannot restore anything in this country without that kind of commitment. And there will be a cost. I stand absolutely firmly on biblical values. I will not shrink from it. And I take more abuse than almost anybody in the United States does. And I go around the world, and I stand for this truth. I went to Uganda in 2009, my third trip to that country, and I preached against homosexuality in that country. After I left, they came out with a bill that unfortunately had a too harsh penalty against homosexuality, which I had nothing to do with. I was on record of what I actually uh, suggested to them in their law. But nevertheless, the left took the opportunity to abuse me globally as the mastermind of the so-called Kill the Gays bill, right? The, 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 the London Guardian newspaper, the New York Times, the Canadian National Press, uh, ABC Nightline, all of these mega... Uh, leftist news sources bashing me for being the person responsible for wanting to assassinate homosexuals, right? It's the kind of attack that makes you want to turn and run. The devil comes, his talent, he has no ability to move you off, your, off the, the ground you stand on. He can't do it. But what he can do is he can create the impression of a gigantic wall of flames that's rushing toward you, ready to consume you, so that you, in fear, back up and start running away. And then he just simply takes the territory that you were standing on. That's what happens. You have to be ready for that. The John Burt Society people are the original victims of the smear. I remember the first time I ever heard about the John Burt Society was that this is an anti-Semitic organization. You've got to stay away from them. Right? I didn't know anything about them. I'm just a pothead teenager. <laughs> Later on, here I am, when I'm, finally, when I'm finally turned around, I've got my feet standing on the, on the rock of Jesus Christ, and I'm starting to understand the truth of things and speaking about it. Who are the people standing firmly at my side? It's John Burt Society members, right? And now, I've been smeared at least as badly as they have. And so, now I'm even closer uh, uh, in, in, uh, in alignment with John Burt Society members. And, and I know that you are absolutely not anti-Semitic, 
as I am not. My co-author of this book is Orthodox Jewish. And uh, anyway, that's what they do. They smear, don't they? Well, I've been, I, I've been, was bashed for a long time. And then in March of this year, uh, the, the um, Center for Constitutional Rights. Doesn't that sound like a great organization? Oh, yeah, yeah. Center for Constitutional Rights? I'd like to be part of that. But actually, they're communists. <laughs> yeah, which constitution? Boy, I don't know if they're actual communists, but they sure act like communists. They're Marxists in their ideology. They filed a lawsuit against me in, the, in federal court here in, uh, in Springfield, Massachusetts for crimes against humanity of persecution, right? I'm the first American in history to be accused and charged with crimes against humanity of persecution of homosexuals based on preaching against homosexuality in Uganda, something that is absolutely legal and endorsed and, and applauded by 95% of that population, something that is protected by the U.S. Constitution under the First Amendment here Amendment, yeah. in the United yeah. States. And how can they do this? They used the Alien Tort Statute, which is something that was, that was done in the late 1700s, one of the early laws of the United States, that would allow for an American to be held accountable for serious violations of international law. And they, so that's the hook that they've got. And what they, have they done? They've taken a European standard of jurisprudence. For, and even in Europe, they don't have the ability to prosecute somebody for preaching against homosexuality. But nevertheless, they've gotten the furthest toward that in Europe as any, than anywhere in the world. And so they have filed this lawsuit against me and used this European, this false in, in, per, uh, interpretation of the European law to, to hold me accountable in my own federal court system, my own country for something that's absolutely perfectly legal to do, that's absolutely protected by the First Amendment. On January 7th, I have to go, and my attorneys are making, uh, fortunately I have Liberty Council, one of the best public interest law firms uh, in, the United, in the United States, wonderful guys. They're going to make our oral arguments for why this case should be dismissed, right? Now, why are they doing this? And I'm the only person named in this. There were other American evangelicals preaching against homosexuality in Uganda, but I believe it's because I stood up. Everybody else ran away. Rick Warren ran away, tried to thr throw me under the bus <laughs> in the process. And, uh, and, and some, some of the others, the, the two other men that I went there with, uh, I knew that they were, weren't really up to sort of taking on the political fight that this would represent. I kind of stepped in front and said, okay, I'll answer your questions. And, uh, and, that's, and this is the result of it. I'm not backing down. I don't want to lose this case, but I understand that in in the way things are, it's, it's a possibility that it could happen. It would be very bad for our country. Uh, it would be a very, very bad precedent for this thing to happen. But I understand that this, it's a possibility that it could. It doesn't change anything about who I am or what I'm going to do. Because I believe that uh, I'm following the will of God, and I'm going to continue to stand speaking for his truth as long as I have breath. And if they take, can take everything that I have, but I'm still going to speak, uh, speak the truth. I've been sued five times. I've been sued five times for over $11 million. Uh, and uh, in fact, the first couple of lawsuits that happened are the reason I went to, to, to law school myself, uh, so I could get better skills to be able to stand for what's right. So right now, I'm operating, I'm, I'm a missionary to the pro-family movement all over the world. And, uh, and I... I'm here this morning just to say I am in agreement with you in this room. Uh, I know that, um, that, uh, that among you here are, are the people of courage who have the ability to stand up for what's right regardless of the, of the cost. That there is a tremendous lapse of masculinity in the church, unfortunately, in, in, the, in the church today. And, uh, and it's hard to find people who dare to stand up. But I know that people in this room have that courage. And it's a, and, and I'm proud to be able to stand here with you. And as you continue to take on the big issues, and I really want to encourage you also, I know this is a fundraising event, uh, I want to encourage you to be generous in support of the John Burt Society because there's no other organization like it. So one last commercial before I, I sit down. I don't sell books. 
I sell subscriptions to my newsletter. $25 for one year, $40 for two years. If you get a subscription for one year, you can have either book for free. If for two years, you can have both books for free. And uh, I, I only have about a dozen copies of the Pink Swabs, about 10 of the three. This book, by the way, this is a textbook on understanding the homosexual issue. I actually thought this would be my last book on the topic. I put everything that I've learned in 20 years into this book. This is the one, if you could only have one book, <coughs> and you had to bring yourself up to speed on what this movement is about, this is the book, Redeeming the Rainbow. And uh, this was actually my doctoral thesis. I have a PhD uh, for the Pentecostal Assemblies of God. This book is actually my thesis reworked in the form of a textbook. So anyway, that's available, the Pink Swastika, and uh, I guess that's it. God bless you. Thank you. Scott will be around to uh, for his books and any questions sort of off the podium. And uh, so I want to thank you all. Oh, by the way, uh, we're videotaping this, and if you like, that's what this note is for. I'm thinking, right? Without even without even seeing it. And if you'd like a copy of it, five dollars. See this uh, distinguished gentleman here behind the camera, and he'll be very prompt. He has a cable TV show in um, uh, Weymouth, Weymouth, Massachusetts. Yes, and I know there's a few others, and we also look it up on YouTube. I'm sure we're going to get some negative responses when this videotape goes out, and that's good. We'll get a lot of positives, though, but it's, it's good stuff. Uh, if you haven't paid me for the, for the meal, uh, please uh, do so before you leave. And uh, a lot of people say, gee, Hal, can I help you carry stuff out back to the car? You know, when you pack up, the best way you can help me out is to buy some material, and that way there you can uh, carry it out. And this actually isn't a fundraiser, but if anyone wants to make a donation, I'd we'll be happy to accept it to the John Berger site. I have a little plate here for uh, if you want to help Scott's ministry. And I do recommend uh, the books, uh, uh, purchasing, I guess, the newsletter, and you get a free book. I like that. I, is the autograph free, too, or you have to pay another? Well, that's an extra 50 Oh, uh, okay. Oh, well, well worth it. Three and, uh, autographs. Okay, with that, I, uh, I want to uh, thank you. Have a very Merry Christmas, and God bless you all. Till we thank see you. Till we see you.